All right, hello and welcome to the talk about manual SFFS share backups. Uh, my name is Robert and I work at CERN as a junior fellow software engineer. And I mainly focus on storage integration into container environments and their deployment at CERN. So this is the agenda for the session. First, we'll have a look at uh, what kind of storage we want to actually back up. Um, after that, we'll briefly describe the individual components. Uh, right after that, we'll have a look uh, exactly how we want to carry out the backups, uh, what is the workflow we would like to follow. Uh, after that, uh, we'll have a peek into the future work that still needs to be done because as you'll see later on in the in the presentation, there are still a couple of blocker issues that uh, we are facing and those need to be resolved first. So I really take this whole talk uh, more as a project update rather than a, a showcase of a final ready to use product. And in the end, we will uh, conclude with uh, the summary. So quickly about CERN itself, it's the European Organization for Nuclear Research. Uh, it's located in Geneva, Switzerland, at the Swiss-French border. Uh, it was founded in 1954, and its main mission is fundamental science, which means uh, it's trying to answer such questions as what is the 96% of the universe made of? What is dark matter, dark energy? What was the state of matter just after the Big Bang? And a lot more questions of this kind. Uh, to try to answer those questions, CERN has built uh, these very large machines uh, called particle accelerators. The one you can see on the photo here is uh, the largest of its kind. It's called LHC. It's uh, of a circular shape, uh, 27 kilometers in circumference, and it's placed in a tunnel 100 meters below ground. And in this uh, in this tunnel, there are two beams of protons being uh, traveling uh, in opposite directions and being accelerated uh, very close to the speed of light. And they are made to be collided with one another at, uh, at another kind of huge machines. This, is, this one is called uh, a detector uh, that is then able to monitor the aftermath of the collision. Uh, and this is basically what the physicists then uh, study and analyze at CERN. Uh, those detectors uh, generate huge amounts of data, and even after all of the fil filtering is done, it's still tens of petabytes per year that needs to be stored and analyzed. And for that, we, have, uh, we are running a private cloud based on OpenStack. This is a pretty recent screenshot of our Grafana dashboard. You can see we have around 460,000 physical cores, 87,000 VMs uh, running on almost 58,000 hypervisors. We are also running around 360 Kubernetes clusters. We have uh, OpenShift as well, but Kubernetes leads by far in, uh, in the numbers. For storage, we have those kinds of numbers. Uh, Block devices around 3.8 petabytes, file shares almost 900 tera, and object storage at around 48 terabytes. Uh, this is all backed by Ceph. Uh, it's mostly application and user data. For things like physics data, machine learning models, we use EOS. Uh, this one picks at around 500 petabytes, but it, this also includes the uh, tape archives. Uh, so this is all a lot of data, but for the purposes of this presentation, we will only focus on the file shares. So that's around 900 terabytes, uh, but not all of this amount needs to be uh, backed up because uh, pretty big chunks of this amount is used by CI, by QA, by testing environments and development environments. So we don't really need to back up those. Uh, so we did some accounting and by some estimates, we have around 65 projects that are deploying uh, 159 production Kubernetes clusters, and those uh, then store around 74 terabytes of uh, manual SFS storage. So that's basically the kind of numbers we are uh, looking at. So um, 
I mentioned Manila SFS shares. It's in the title of the presentation as well. So what exactly are those? So Ceph is a scalable distributed storage system uh, that we rely on heavily. Uh, it's, uh, it offers three interfaces for the storage in the same package, uh, object store called Redos, uh, block devices, RBDs, uh, Redos block devices, and then shared file systems uh, called CephFS. Uh, and this is uh, the last one is uh, what we are focusing on right now. Then we have the OpenStack Manila, uh, which is shared file system service for OpenStack. Uh, and it's the, uh, it's the point of uh, where basically the shared storage systems are able to uh, interact with the OpenStack cloud. Uh, it supports a lot of different uh, technologies, around 35 of those, both proprietary and open source. But for us, the main use case for Manila, or the main backend that we use it with, is the CFFS file systems. Uh, it also provides multi-tenancy, quota management, all very important features that we rely on. Uh, then lastly, we have CSI. It's the container storage interface. And uh, it forms this, uh, well, it's an interface between some storage system and the container orchestrator, for example, Kubernetes. And it allows storage vendors to write their own uh, storage drivers, and th those drivers are called CSI drivers. And uh, uh, basically, it forms like a middleman between the storage and the orchestrator. So uh, there is also some uh, integration into the orchestrators themselves. So you can create PVCs. And those PVCs uh, are then fulfilled by uh, by whatever that particular CSI driver is doing. Both CFFS and Manila have their own CSI drivers that we rely on uh, in our container workloads. So let's take a look at uh, them right now. Uh, so for Manila CSI, this is what the structure looks like. Uh, it's split into two main components. Uh, first one is controller plugin that handles the cluster-wide operations, like creating, PVC, uh, creating volumes uh, at the Manila, uh, using the Manila service at that particular storage backend. And then the second component is uh, the node plugin, which then handles all of the node local operations like mounting volume on a node and then exposing it to the workloads on that node. The important thing to note here is that uh, Manual CSI doesn't uh, do the mounts by itself. It relies on other third-party CSI drivers that are uh, dedicated to, uh, uh, to whatever file system we are using uh, uh, on that particular Manila share. So, for example, in case of CFFS, uh, the workflow is basically this. Um, when the kubelet tells Manila CSI to mount a volume, uh, then the CSI driver asks Manila service uh, what sort of uh, information is needed to mount that share. In case of CFFS, this is the uh, monitor IPs, the root path of the volume, and CFX credentials. And those are then forwarded to the CFFS CSI node plugin, which is a completely separate CSI driver. And it has uh, the, tool, the tools needed to actually carry out the mount on the node and uh, then expose it to the consumer pod. So let's say we have a. PVC with Manila CFS share, uh, how would we go about backing it up? Uh, this is the workflow we would like to follow. Uh, so it consists of six steps, quiescing the application, creating a snapshot, uh, unquiescing, creating a volume from the snapshot, then backing up this intermediate volume and removing, uh, removing it along with the snapshot. So let's break down those. Um, steps one by one. Uh, 
Uh, classing the application serves two purposes. Uh, first one is that it stops or pauses the application for, uh, from processing any further requests. Uh, this is because usually you don't want to uh, snapshot a live volume that's still being written to uh, at the same time as you are taking a snapshot of the data that you want to back up. The second <coughs> point here is that uh, the application uh, of which you are taking, uh, of which you are uh, backing up the volumes, uh, it might need to be aware of the fact that you are taking the snapshot because uh, it might store some in-memory uh, buffers or caches that haven't been yet written to the to the snapshot, so it needs to flush those caches, and then you can uh, take a snapshot of the volume. Otherwise, you could get inconsistent data. Uh, this is, of course, very application-specific, and not all apps need that. Some applications don't. Some applications would even consider this uh, disruptive because uh, they might prefer availability and not being paused uh, rather than uh, having a consistent uh, state on the disk being uh, snapshotted. So uh, we have created a snapshot now. Then uh, step number three, unquestioning the application means uh, resuming, uh, resuming it and making it uh, available to uh, process the requests again. And now we can actually think about backing up uh, the data that we have just snapshotted. The problem, however, is that you can't really back up a snapshot. Uh, because uh, as far as uh, CSI and Kubernetes are concerned, snapshots are these uh, completely opaque uh, storage-specific objects that you cannot really access. You cannot access the underlying data from within Kubernetes. What you can do, though, is create a volume from that snapshot, and then this volume you can actually mount somewhere and uh, walk the directory structure and copy uh, the files from it into your backup location, for example, an S3 bucket. Uh, so that's number four. Uh, and step number five is uh, basically just copying the data into the backup location. And lastly, we can remove this intermediate volume and snapshot because they are no longer needed. We have written all of the data we, we meant to backup. Uh, for restoration, uh, the uh, workflow is much more uh, relaxed in terms of number of steps. Uh, uh, we just have to download the data from the backup location and into the original volume and then we somehow round the ap application. This is, of course, uh, very specific to each case, uh, but in general, as far as the volume backups are concerned, this is uh, uh, what we would do. So what this means for Manila and CFS CSI drivers is that uh, as long as they, uh, they have the capabilities to uh, fulfill all of the actions we have seen in the workflow. Uh, users can choose whatever uh, backup solution they wish to use. And as, as long as this solution also supports CSI and is able to execute this workflow, then uh, we are good to go. Uh, we see that uh, the workflow is very heavily reliant on snapshotting. And the good news is that uh, both of those CSI drivers support snapshots and creating, snapshot, uh, creating volumes from snapshots. The bad news is, however, that this operation is extremely uh, expensive. That's because FFS uh, doesn't really know how to create uh, uh, thinly provisioned volume from a snapshot source. Uh, so what you would have to normally do is to copy the files 
from the snapshot and into the target volume. And as you can imagine, that's very inefficient. So that's one of the things we've been working on uh, for CFS CSI uh, is to have uh, the ability to create volumes from snapshots in constant time. Uh, technically, this is quite uh, trivial because CFFS uh, exposes snapshots right there in, in the volume, in this special .snap folder. And uh, then the individual, uh, then the subdirectories of this .snap folder uh, uh, are basically the, the snapshots that you have taken. Uh, they are read-only, but that's fine. Uh, so what we do basically is just store a reference to some particular uh, snapshot, store it in the persistent volume object during the provisioning phase. And when it comes to mounting this volume, we just uh, navigate to the correct snapshot and uh, uh, present that to the uh, pods on the, on the node. Uh, this feature is basically done, and it will be part of the 3.7 release of CFS CSI, scheduled sometime next month. So that's good. Uh, similarly, uh, the same feature needs to be implemented in Manila CSI. Uh, and in this case, the implementation of mounting the, the snapshot is even easier made by the fact that uh, basically if this guy already implements the logic to mount a CFS snapshot, then Manila CSI uh, only needs to pass in the correct parameters to let CFS CSI know that, yes, mount this snapshot, and that's it, basically. Uh, so in theory, this is very easy. Uh, in practice, this is also the time where we hit our first road, roadblock issue. Uh, and it's connected to the fact how uh, CFFS exposes uh, snapshots within this special .snap directory. Uh, and well, because of, of a bug or uh, incorrect handling of, uh, of snapshot names, uh, we are basically unable to access snapshot data within this .snap directory. Uh, so we are sort of stuck at this point. Uh, there are luckily al already uh, patches for, for this issue upstream, and it's big, being uh, worked on. But uh, right now, manual is I cannot uh, implement this feature. But as soon as this is done, uh, we can move to the next step, which is then uh, choosing the, the correct uh, backup tool to, uh, to carry out the, the backup procedures. Because uh, what we are doing is uh, implementing uh, the functionality needed by the CSI drivers. The other part of the equation is to actually have some, some tool to actually execute the workflow of, of the backup. And uh, that's one of the tools you can see up here. Uh, some of them are uh, proprietary. Some of them are open source. Uh, and the approach we are taking with our users is basically it's up to them, whatever tool they wish to to use because they differ oh, oh, in quality in uh, the features they provide. And it's really the users who know their applications uh, well, and they can decide what features are important for their use case. Uh, right now, we are uh, evaluating Velero. Uh, and it's an open source tool. Uh, it provides scheduled backups, pre- and post-backup hooks, data retention, so uh, things that our users would be interested in. And actually, uh, our colleagues uh, from the Drupal infrastructure team 
Edsron. Uh, they are already using Velero without snapshots, though, because they, they cannot use them right now. Uh, and they were kind enough to share their experience, experiences with us. Uh, so in general, Velero works very well. Uh, works well for uh, when you want to back up the cluster uh, resource definitions or, or the objects. Uh, but as soon as you want to back up persistent volumes and the underlying data they point to, uh, that's when things start to get more interesting. Uh, so the rule is basically that if the backend storage system is able to upload the data to uh, the backup location by itself without, uh, by itself and in the background without you having to deploy some sort of uh, external tool within, uh, in your Kubernetes cluster that does the copying for you. So as long as you don't need this tool, uh, you're fine. And this is the case for EBS, Google Persistent Disks, uh, Azure Managed Disks, and similar. Uh, there are storage systems where this is not the case. Ceph is one of them. And uh, if that's your case as well, you, you, you need this external tool that does the copying from your volume and into, for example, S3 bucket. Uh, in case of Velero, uh, the tool is called Restic. And uh, so it, it does what I just said, copying file system in, into an S3 bucket. And also the other way around, uh, downloading the data from bucket into a volume. And uh, it also provides deduplication, uh, encryption, all very cool features. But this is also the place where we, uh, where we see most of the issues. So the first one is large memory consumption. Uh, OK, this is not very visible, but uh, so our colleagues from the Drupal, Drupal infra team have seen peaks of even 25 gigabytes of memory on the node. But as of Velero 171, it's gotten significantly better. Uh, it's around 8 gigs. And, but still, uh, this is expected because uh, Restic needs to do the deduplication and that takes a lot of memory to keep the indices around. So uh, it's understandable, but the problem is that the node on which uh, the Restic pod is running might not be large enough to carry out the backup uh, operation. Uh, in, at which point, well, it just uh, runs out of memory, it is killed, uh, which brings us to the next issue, that failed backups stay failed. There, there are no retries. Um, so when a, pot, uh, when a RESTIC pod goes out of memory, uh, it is killed, and then it is restarted, because Velero deploys it as a daemon set. So it is restarted right, like any other daemon set pod would be. And you would expect that uh, Restic would be able to uh, continue where it left off uh, before it was killed due to uh, running out of memory. But this is not what we saw. Uh, what we observed was basically it just got stuck uh, until the backup action fail, uh, backup action uh, timed out at which point uh, the Valero controller just move on to the next backup item. And this all was done silently. We didn't see any errors only after the whole backup job finished. And, and that's when we could see the, the issue. But uh, it wasn't a very good user experience. Um, and then the last issue uh, we have seen is sca scaling issues. And this is linked to the, to the fact that 
Valero processes backup items in sequence, one by one. And if you have a lot of PVCs, and those, all of those PVCs need to be copied out using RESTIC, uh, then you can imagine you, have, you might have some problems. So again, our colleagues from the Drupal Infra team, uh, they are managing around 1,000 PVCs for their infrastructure. Uh, they are fairly large, um, and they wanted to have uh, daily backups, but because uh, the time it takes to back up the whole infrastructure takes almost 48 hours. They literally cannot have daily backups. Uh, so where to go from here? Uh, it's not all that bad. Uh, Valero developers are working hard on uh, improving this, uh, all of the, those issues. You can see it on their repository page. The community is very active. Uh, and from what, what I could see, they are planning to uh, improving their CSI snapshotting capabilities, hopefully also providing support for the backup workflow we've seen a couple of slides earlier. Uh, after that, they are uh, considering adding alternatives to RESTIC, uh, for example, Copia. Uh, and I'd like to point out that RESTIC is by no means like a uh, bad tool. Uh, our Ceph team uses it, uses it in uh, their uh, internal operations on millions of files, and uh, it works just fine. It's just the nature of uh, container environment is perhaps too, too volatile for, for it to be running. And uh, uh, it's nice that we get to see some alternatives for the cases where, uh, where it makes sense. Uh, and because we were pretty curious about this comparison between RESTIC and Copia, we've made some benchmarks. Uh, those are very much just preliminary benchmarks uh, on a small data set in very controlled conditions. Uh, so not really something to be taken very seriously, but it gives an idea of what things might look like once, the, once Valero receives this copia support. So what we had was uh, a volume with about 1.5 million files. This was just uncompressed copies of the Linux kernel. And it was the same Linux kernel. So majority of the files were, well, all of the files were uh, the same, which uh, using which we could uh, exercise this deduplication feature and compare RESTIC to Copia really well. Uh, and as you can see on the numbers, uh, just judging by the elapsed time, Copia seems to perform better. It's how, uh, it's pay, it spends half the time of what the RESTIC needs to have to complete both backup and restore. Uh, the memory consumption uh, is, there is even larger difference. I'm not exactly sure what's going on here yet. Uh, because it's quite significant, and the S3 bucket size is also uh, lower in case of Copia, because Copia does uh, uh, maybe better splitting the data into objects, and it also does compression. So that's one of the reasons why the bucket size in case of Copia is smaller. And for resting the uh, for uh, restoring the story is very much the same. So to conclude, uh, what we wanted to achieve was providing our users with the ability to have consistent backups. For that, you need snapshotting support. And sadly, right now, the snapshotting support is not there yet, uh, but it's being addressed. Uh, so if you need back, uh, snapshot support as well, you, you have to wait, and so do we. If you don't, and your application is not that sensitive to have uh, 
in, maybe inconsistent state on the uh, on the disk and that being backed up, then you're, you're good to go. But also being mindful of the limitations that we have experienced. So uh, pretty large memory consumption and scaling issues. But in the end, uh, they are all being addressed, so uh, we are looking forward to that. All right, so that's it. Uh, thank you, and are there any questions? There is a mic, by the way. How do you quiesce your applications? Sorry? Uh, how do you quiesce and unquiesce your application? Because there is no native support in Kubernetes. There is none, but uh, in Velero, you can run bash script that does whatever you or the application needs to be done for it to quiesce. Uh, so this is the support that is there in Valero. Uh, I'm just wondering why you're not uh, using the uh, your Ceph uh, um, support for snapshots or mirroring to another Ceph cluster. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this is not yet available in Manila, uh, or is it? Uh, so we have a uh, manual <laughs> developer right there. No, uh, Ceph supports um, mirroring the snapshots to another cluster, so. Right, but in, in, some, uh, in some cases you might want to back up to some, something else than Ceph, and in those cases you might need to uh, just ha have some general tool that does S3 bucket uh, clone. I'm just saying it would save you lots of time. Mm. Okay. Hi. Uh, it was not clear when you do a backups here, right? There was one backup, but what about multiple backups, like scheduled backups? Are they incremental, not incremental? What are these different tools provide uh, in related to those mm -hmm. things? Uh, so both uh, Restic and Copia, by default, well, th that's the only thing they can do is incremental backups. Okay. Okay. And on the restore side, uh, do, do they uh, restore all the content before they uh, allow application uh, start? Uh, uh, like it, de it depends, but yes, in general, uh, you, you first need to uh, restore your, your data before the application is be able to be resumed. Yeah, because yeah. I, uh, one of the slides you mentioned, that like almost 65 terabyte of data on one of the volume, right? So restoring that could take probably many hours, so. Yeah, the, well, the, there is no other way, I mean, you lost your data, you need to first to get it back and only then continue. But uh, there are tools uh, other than Velero that enable you to define your own workflows. For example, this one, Canister, uh, which I found was very interesting project. You can define your own workflow and if your application has specific needs, uh, you can uh, declare them in, in that workflow, and uh, maybe that's the way. Okay, thank you. Hi. Um, what do you do uh, with applications that you can't pause? Like, that's impossible to stop because they have mm. to keep on processing. Uh, well, then you might suffer from inconsistencies in the backups, but maybe having some backups are better than to have none. Maybe having inconsistent backups is just uh, what you have to deal with, but yeah, it's an issue that okay. 
we yeah. don't have clear answer to. Okay. Thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, my question would be, have you built any automation to verify backups? Like to verify that you can actually re restore the, the data after the backup? Mm -hmm. uh, so right now we are at the point of just evaluating this in our Kubernetes offerings. So we don't have, we are not at the point of uh, having a proper CI for this. But definitely this is something we would be aiming to have. Okay, I think we have actually run out of time, 35 minutes. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, enjoy your lunch.